the keys to the kingdom were given by Jesus to Peter. That's why Peter was the spokesman of the day of Pentecost. All the other apostles were there, including John, the one that Jesus loved most, who was closest to Jesus, and the one to whom Jesus gave the deepest revelation. But he gave the keys to Peter. On the day of Pentecost, it says Peter, standing up the eleven, preached the first message to the church. There's no accident that Peter opened the door to the church to the Gentiles when he preached to Cornelius and his family. But it's very clear in scripture in the called the home church home assembly located in Jerusalem Bishop James was in charge now there were two disciples two apostles named James not either one of those. This James, in charge of the Jerusalem church, is James, the brother of Jesus. Jesus said, another half brother named Jude. Jude wrote the shortest epistle the New Testament, but in my opinion, it's the most powerful epistle written in the New Testament. It's placement, where it's placed in the Bible, is of great importance. He's placed between John, you know about John already, if you don't, if in the Bible, you know a whole lot about John. What a great epistle he is. The great, the great epistle he wrote. Jews between John and judgment, which is revelation. That's what Jude says, see what he wrote. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Now this part here is the next verse. I don't believe, well, let's put it this way, Jude may have had somebody in mind, although I doubt it that he was just writing an administration of the Holy Ghost. For this next verse, knowing it or not, he's writing by his brother James. He said, but there are certain men who crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into a seriousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord, Jesus Christ. The part that gets my attention with James. that he crept in. He says he crept in unaware. Unaware by who? Everybody else. The 11 apostles allowed James that office. They shouldn't have. We know that when Jude, not Jude, this one, this 
the treasury system. Judas. When Judas took himself out, not following God's instructions, just wait in Jerusalem, Peter, impetuous Peter, found the scripture in the Old Testament about Judas, where it said, let his bishopric be given to another, let another take his office. The key word in that particular instruction was let, meaning allow his bishopric to be given to another and his office to be given to another. Peter misread it, <clears throat> not being anointed at that time, and he decided to have a vote. It's amazing how he can read something in the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost said. It allows Peter to discover it, and Peter thinks it's his calling now to fix it. Like, he's right to, to Peter. He should realize the Holy Ghost knew about Judas' defection way before Judas was born, and said, when Judas does this, leave his office vacant. Let it be given to another. It didn't say give it to another, but let it be given to another. Big difference. It's saying that the Holy Ghost knew what Judas was going to do, and the Holy Ghost would fill the vacancy. Just leave it alone. Well, they voted. It's a case of men trying to run Jesus' church. It ain't going to happen. Never has. Never will. But they have served, caused some damage in trying to do it. They voted Matthias in. So the lot fell upon two men. Who's the other one here right now? Matthias. Hmm? What'd you say? Who's the other man besides Matthias? Well, there's two men. Hmm? I don't speak up. Yeah. Barnabas. Barnabas. The fact that when they prayed for this problem and two men's name came up, they should have dropped it. They said, the Holy Ghost gives a tithe. So the Holy Ghost decides which one it wants when the Holy Ghost gets ready. But they voted. A vote has never, ever had a place in God's church. Ever. It's a common practice these days. When the church becomes vacant, put another pastor in, they vote. After they vote, put one in, then some comes up there and like him, then they'll vote him out. And church do that every day. Dean Scott just of his congregation. He said, you're going to vote me out anytime to get ready. He said, I'll start a church across the street. Another one. They voted. The lot fell upon Matthias. This is on the chapter one of Acts, in case you want to check it out. And that's the first and last time you read his name. Nothing else said about Matthias. Which shows you that Matthias was not the choice of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost will call another man. Later on. One born of due season. Paul. Who of all the people that were apostles, Paul had to defend his apostleship more than everybody. You have old chapters that says, am, am I not an apostle? Have I not a right to forbear working? Have I not a right to read about sister or wife as Peter and the rest of the apostles did? He was a replacement chosen by the Holy Ghost. Paul told a simple message. He received from the Lord. His message was simply justification by faith without 
works. It's a lost message, believe it or not. It was resurrected again in the late 1800s. by a man named Martin Luther. The namesake of Martin Luther King. Martin Luther was with the Catholic Church, came across this message in the Bible, and began preaching it. It's called, a period of time, the Reformation. They reformed the doctrine. And of course, the church had a fit about it. They were mad at him. He got word, so the story goes, from the Pope, by way of one of the bishops or cardinals, they told him that the whole world's against you. And he sent back a message to them and said, Tell the world I'm against it. One man. He marked, I believe, the Philadelphia Church Age. That's the church age that Jesus said that I am neither open it, and no man shut it. And that shut it, no man open it. Martin Luther opened up this doctrine to the church and was around to shut it. He's the main character that time. Point is though, Paul, preaching this message, was in opposition to James. What did James preach? Turn here. Chapter, chapter 2. Verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Blatant difference here. James had to understand, too, that James didn't follow Jesus while he was alive and preaching. He came afterwards. He didn't know the doctrine that his brother, his half brother taught. See, so neither did Paul. Yeah, Paul did. Paul said, I got saved in Damascus. There to arrest people. He got saved. He said, I continued in Damascus, and I went to the desert of Arabia for two years and was taught the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, for two years. He said, 14 years later, I went to Jerusalem to compare what I was teaching with the other apostles. That's he made this great statement. He says, and I found I was on a whip behind the chiefest apostle in Jerusalem. I knew more than all of them, if not more, at least as much. James could make that claim. He couldn't boast any time he spent with Jesus. He came in late, as I said, and he crept in. And he's allowed to do so by the apostles. Just because he is Jesus' half brother. He took control over the largest church of that time in Jerusalem. I don't know what the exact membership was. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were baptized. Most of them from that area. Later on, in one, one baptism, one setting, 5,000 were baptized. He says, assume that the Jerusalem church had a membership around 8,000 members. Right? Led by this man, James, who asked the question, can faith save somebody? With me? Yeah. 
If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and what do you say to him? Depart in peace, be warm and filled. Notwithstanding, you give him them not those things which are needful to the body, but of the prophet. He's right there. You might just say, come across my knee. If you're saved, you can't say, look, be warm and filled. But God put that person across your pathway. He put it across your pathway because you had that which he needed to be warm and filled. And God took you to give it to him. My logic is, what does that have to do? What does this have to do with the issue? Even so, faith, I see. If it has not works, it's dead, being alone. Like it's right there, too. That's the crazy part about yourself reading this. <laughs> God allows this to go into the record, not so much to get across the rightest of James' message, but the wrongness of it. But even the wrong message has parts of right, which is kind of confusing. I've read more commentaries of those trying to defend James and Peter, James and Paul, so that there wasn't a rift between them after all. There was. The big difference. That's why when Paul gives a account again of his experience after being saved, he said, I went to Jerusalem for 15 days. He said, I saw James. And that's what he said. He said, I abode with Peter for 15 days. I saw James. He probably exactly what I mean. There's James. Hey, James. That was all. And when Peter writes this gospel, Peter says, Paul wrote many things hard to understand. And understand. Paul had like a PhD in the law of Moses, and Peter was an ignorant fisherman, ignorant and unlearned. Yet God chose Peter because Peter would be able to relate to the common man easier than Paul would. One thing I love about Peter is that in listening to Paul, putting time on Paul, he realized Paul was a giant in God's word, but Peter didn't dismiss anything Paul said. He learned from Paul, and I believe Paul learned from Peter. The only person that didn't appear to learn, to learn anything from Peter or Paul is James. Yet a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Well, to get an understanding of this clearly, it's best to find works. What are the works he's speaking of? There's two types of works. Number one, your own. Chosen by you. Number two, the other works of the Spirit. Chosen by God. Number one has been labeled these days and Probably so. Good deed. You've all met Christians who talk about going out doing their good deed for the day. Good deeds are nice. But that's all they are. Good deeds give you zero points with God. So funny, because the ones doing good deeds are doing good deeds to get points with God. They go try to find a good deed. I find it interesting, they never go find a good deed that they don't want to do. The good deed has to be compatible with them. On the other hand, 
You got a story of a good Samaritan who did not just a good deed but a great deed. But it wasn't his plan. Works 